Hey everyone, welcome back to Be Not Afraid. I am so excited for this conversation today. And it's really funny because the person that I'm speaking to, we don't agree on everything. And I actually really love that because I'm hoping that we can model having a reasonable and compassionate conversation without having to just align verbatim on everything. So today my guest is Patricia McCormick. Patricia is an author and she wrote the book Sold. I was asked to reach out to her um, to talk about my concerns as a parental advocate. And our conversation was just so wonderful that we decided to try and recreate it as authentically as possible. So welcome, Patricia. Thank you so much. I've been so looking forward to having our conversation today. Uh, as you said, it was so refreshing to see what two people talking face to face could do as opposed to the ways that we talk to each other in the public sphere. So. Right. It's it's funny to me because when I first saw your book sold, um, I never in all in all um honesty, I hadn't actually read the entire book. I was given a section of the book and it brought up a lot of concerns for me. Um and the kind of things that people will say, and I will get myself in trouble on both sides, I understand in this conversation, but the kind of things that people will say to just go after and attack the person without understanding the content um, or the reason behind it. Uh, some of the things I've heard most recently are, are people saying these people should go to hell. And I, I cannot wrap my head around being that way towards another person. Mm -hmm. Well, you made the point too, that, you know, we don't need to attack the person. There are certain ideologies or certain you know, for lack of a better word, agendas or positions that we might not align with, right. but uh, we get nowhere right. by talking dirt toward. Or, or, or maybe we do other. get somewhere, but where it is is very so much distance. We get so much farther apart. Right. So tell me about your book. Thanks. So um, this book has been around for quite some time, and years ago I heard about. Um, child trafficking, about girls who were sold, usually by family members, um, into prostitution. And I remember saying at the time, oh, this isn't happening now, right? And the man who told me about it explained that, yes, it was current. And I thought, well, somebody needs to write this story from the girl's point of view, that there's been a lot of good journalism about child trafficking. But to really open our hearts I thought that to sink into the experience of the child who's being uh, brutalized in this way is the thing that's going to really move people to take action against it. So um, I went to India and Nepal, and I'm not like, you know, super duper international sleuth or anything like that. I was very lucky, but I snuck into some brothels. I snuck into a, a prison in Kathmandu. I think I had that kind of both beginner's luck and that sense of this is a passion project and I need to bring this information out. And so maybe I'm going to be protected from my own foolishness, the risks that I took. And I think the other thing that's worth uh, talking about is that I'm a survivor of childhood sexual abuse. And so I could, even though my experience wasn't um, as serious as uh, this, the experiences I wanted to portray in the book, I felt a real, uh, affinity and connection toward people to whom this has happened and wanted to use whatever position I have to shine light on that experience in the hopes that it would change minds. Right. And that was something that we, we discussed because I also am a victim of um, child sexual abuse. Um, and my story is that I spent three days in a camper with a man um, when I was five years old. And so it's funny because both of us are driven by this desire to protect. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and and we do it in very different ways. Coming from different uh, directions, yeah. Exactly. But isn't that lovely that we did find quite quickly that we had that in common? Not that our childhood ex uh, sexual assault experiences, right. but that our, our motive was to um, be an advocate for kids. Yes. Yes. And that is, it's just one of those things where you, where you look at it and when you can see the human 
in the conversation. And then you can not come at them just attacking. So when we were talking about the books and what my concerns are, and I'm just going to read a section of, of the book. Um, and this is, this is how it's presented to me. I get a list of all of the different kind of, sorry, over here. I get a list of where it's coming from. So it's coming from a high school. Um, and this is in Utah, which we've had that discussion. Utah is very different culturally. A lot of people move here to shelter their kids. Mm -hmm. So um, she grabs me my, by my hair and drags me across the room. She flings me onto the bed next to an old man. And then he's on top of me, holding me down with the strength of 10 men. He kisses me with lips that are slack and the wet taste of onions. His teeth dig into my lower lip. Underneath the weight of them, I cannot see or move or breathe. He fumbles with his pants, forces my legs apart, and I can feel him pushing between my thighs. There's there's more. It's It, it gets more and more intense. Um, but what I saw when I first saw that and what a lot of the parents who who saw it, they came to me and they were just like, this can't be in our schools. Um, is that it's very different where you were coming from in an in inner city and where I'm coming from in rural Utah. Um, kids, you know, they still, some of them uh, are still raised to wait until marriage. Mm -hmm. And so the first thing that they see is if that's their first experience with sex, I believe that that would wreck them. I believe that that, that, that would just ruin their innocence. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that's been interesting is that we actually have this in some of our junior highs and we have some teachers fighting to keep it in the schools. I do want to make one point that even in the people who, who've created this, and what they want is a rating system. So just so you can see, they want a rating system. Mm -hmm. Your book does get a five. <laughs> but they say, this book has sexually explicit excerpts and sexual assault, as well as graphic violence involving child abuse. This book requires a very high level of maturity and should not be read by anyone under the age of 18. However, there is significant literary and educational value for adults. So I feel like they were trying to be um, reasonable, at least the people, and, and we both know Brooke, at least I believe Brooke's heart was trying to be reasonable. But what happens a lot of times is people just go towards, this is rot, this is evil. And they're not completely wrong, not in your book, but there is stuff with the American Library Association where the goal is to uh, to remove childhood innocence. So we, let's take them uh, yeah. one at a time, maybe. Sure. Uh, let's start with a place where we agree. This book should not be in junior high. I get invited to speak and read at junior highs, and I say, no, this is not appropriate content for those children. So I find that uh, frustrating and disturbing. Um, that a book like that would fall into the hands of a child who isn't ready for it. So I think we can 100% agree there. So in high school, do you believe that every age of high school is appropriate or that it should, or do you, what do you think about the rating system? Oh gosh, that's complicated. So um, because I, I, I don't know about it as a whole, I only know about it as the way it's been applied to my book. I don't think I have any kind of expertise on it. Um, that said, um, I think that, you know, in uh, publishers will put in the inside of a book what age group they think it's appropriate for. So it's not unheard of to say, this is for high schoolers, or this is for um, what they call new adults, kids over 18. So uh, I think that it's sensitive and wise to think about the material that our kids are going to read. I also think that authors, I, I think that most authors, most people who write for young adults um, are very interested in advocating for those kids. 
and do not want harm to befall them and see their writing as a part of a mission to um, be helpful to kids who might be isolated and struggling with certain experiences or who, who uh, want to know about the world. Um, I also think that there are authors who are just wanting to cash in and make a buck and that those books are not sensitively done. And I wouldn't buy them for my kids. Um, and I, I am frustrated to see those kinds of things being published, but that's just my taste. I think it's more than just taste. And the reason why is um, the other the other thing that, that we talked about was that some people will pick up these books. So you've got you've got two groups. You've got the groups that are that are innocent. Then you mm -hmm. have the, the children who especially have already been traumatized. And they will pick up a book like this. And sometimes they will use that um, to sexually gratify themselves. It's one thing. Um, and also to share it with others. And there is a real, it is very, very sad that kids today find it kind of acceptable or kind of the right thing to do to take the innocence of other children. That's very uh, sad. That's really distressing. I think you're making a good point about the kids. There are two kinds of readers. There are kids who are coming to this uh, fresh and there are kids who already have a trauma background. I, as somebody who has a trauma background, you can relate to this, have been in situations, mostly movies, where the something has come at me, an experience of sexual violence, and I am absolutely pinned to my chair with, with fright. Right. And... Um, it kind of is re-traumatizing experience. I've also found that for both myself and for kids, readers who have had a trauma history have come to me and said, that was my experience. I thought I was the only one until, until I saw it in the book. I thought there was something wrong with me. I thought I should be ashamed, Do you know, so that there was a way in which it opened up a window out of that isolation and shame for them. That's different than the kid who isn't really ready to process such a thing. Yes. Um, and then there are the kids who, by the luck of the draw, do not have trauma in their backgrounds. And they are like, wow, that's happening to my friend down the street. Or, or you know, I've been in classrooms where the kid who has a trauma history will stand up in front of her whole classroom and, and say, something like this is happening to me in my home right now. And I always expect the kids in the classroom, the other kids to, you know, make fun or just be so shocked that they can't deal with it. They're incredibly empathetic. And then the child who is in danger can, can get some help and support from, from adults. So um, it falls on different ears, obviously so differently. And I understand that because when I was in Washington, I, when I was younger, I performed um, for a company called Open Door Theater. And our job was to teach kids to protect themselves from child, from sexual abuse. Um, but we were very, very careful about the words and the language that we used. We would say, I, I have a book and I want to show you a picture. I want to show you um, pictures of naked people in it. And that was the only way we had to be very careful about the language that we use so that we didn't, um, sometimes you can encourage people to trauma bond with you. Mm -hmm. And so we had to be very careful about that, that kind of language that we used, but I still have, for me, it was a matter of, um, and, and it's just, it's just different. Like we, the two of us have had similar experiences, but for me, I believe that putting the most excellent and uplifting things in the classroom or in the library are what we should be doing so that um, like just because a person is having sex or maybe is a teenager who is pregnant, that does not need to be their focus. And also like the normalization of it, I think becomes an issue sometimes. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm I'm so glad that you raised the question of language. And um, I think we have more we can talk about there. Uh, 
And I do want to hear from you about the language that I used and the way that it affected you. I will say that I am always aware that I'm writing for other people's children and that I try to cho choose the language carefully. And in that case, obviously, it's going to be uh, important in a story about um, child trafficking to include an account of rape. And so from, I did it from the point of view of this 13 year old. And to me, it wasn't graphic language. It was more about her bewilderment and her fear and her confusion and her physical pain that there isn't quote unquote graphic language, but it sounds, and I, I want to make a, a note to come back to that question of uh, uplifting things in the school, but let's stay with this for a minute and tell me about how that language affected you. Okay, it actually makes me anxious just to read it. Oh, maybe you don't want to read it then. We just talk okay. about it. No, it, it's okay. I think it's important. So, um, his teeth dig into my lower lip. Underneath the weight of him, I cannot see or move or breathe. He fumbles with his pants. He forces his leg, forces my legs apart. And I can feel him pushing himself between my thighs. I gasp for air and kick and I squirm. He thrusts his tongue into my mouth, and I bite down with all my might. He cries out. I am running. I'm running down the hall. Um, yeah. And then there's more. You're lucky to be with, with Habib. He is squeezing my breast with his hands like someone shopping for a melon. It's very, very reminiscent of... For me, it's very reminiscent. It is almost, I mean, it, it just brings back memories. Um, but the other part, and I, yeah, the other part is that I try not to read these kind of things because, because when something like that happens to you and when you are broken, addiction is a real thing. And so, um, like rape fantasies, things like that. I, mm -hmm. I do live with that kind of thing, you know? Mm -hmm. And morally, I, my religious beliefs, it's not really acceptable. So, um, so fighting that, that's why when, when they hand me these things and they're like, go and speak, I will speak very seldom. And normally what I say is books don't have to be perverse to be diverse, mm -hmm. you know? But the language, I can appreciate that your language is not as, as vulgar as some of the other things that I've read. I've, I've picked up a book from my son, um, or I didn't pick it up. I was listening to an audio book of it just to see if it would be good for a camping trip. And it talked about uh, ejaculating and having come all over, you know, inside the pool and just, just words like that that are... I think they're too much and it's really upsetting when they are on a book that mm -hmm. looks like it's a book for campers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you, it's presented so that kids will click the button and will listen. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a lot of that going on with the new American Library Association president putting these kind of books into our schools that are just they are fully to, as they would use the term, queer children. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean queer as in, I, I have no problem if a person is gay or lesbian or whatever. I have a problem with twisting their minds so that they don't understand reality. Mm -hmm. So um, that's my viewpoint. You know, I'm so sorry that the words that I wrote had such a devastating impact. But that's, um, that's a good writer. I mean, that's, that's a good writer who can take yeah, you. There, but. Yeah. And I, I mean, I think there's something to be said, I'll just speak for myself, that when something that I'm, I don't welcome, but it makes me cry. I know that there was something I needed to cry about, but, and I think you're making a good point too, that some of these books look like one thing and are something else. I think, you know, with a book entitled sold, that it's, that's what it's going to be about. So that, that the child who picks that up um, yes. is curious for better or for worse. Many of them I have always assumed are curious about what's happening to their peers on the other side of the world and want to get involved 
in helping to stop trafficking. Um, but uh, you're making me aware of views about a more, uh, a different kind of reader. Like when you talk about a kid who will pick up something like this and use it to normalize um, behavior that's not ethical. Um, I, I mean, I, I think my world experience might be different from yours and I don't suspect that as happening as often as it does, but maybe it does. And that's why having a conversation like this, I would not be exposed to the way you think. Right. And it'd make me a better writer. I don't think that you're by any means a bad writer. I think that there is some truth in that we have to, because at first I was like, why do we need, why do these parents who have strong views, again, I'm in Utah, I am in Mormon country, okay, people have, while I'm not Mormon myself, people have really strong views on not tainting themselves, mm -hmm. but yet they are required to read entire books to see if the context is there. In a book like yours, I would agree, and like um, I would not, I would not have an issue with this being in a college. Mm -hmm. I don't have an issue with it being in the public library. Mm -hmm. My concern comes from being in in public schools, but I can also really see your point. I want my child to be empathetic. I I choose books based on you know how do we teach this. Another solution that I have is. What about an abridged version? Mm -hmm. You know, um, and I, I had this idea and I was wrong, but I remember reading, I know why the cage bird sings. And that is so very, very close to my own experience growing up. And what I remember, and I guess I blocked it out because what I remember is the person grabbing her hand, her, her stepfather grabbing her hand and walking into the room. I don't remember any of the details of what happened in the room. And I upset some people because I said they wanted, I, I know why the cage bird sings taken out of our schools. And I said, it's never going to happen. That, that book has been in our schools for so long. It's really, it's important work. Um, and I thought that it ended. I thought that it left that stuff out. I've actually used it before in a presentation and said, this is the right way. Again, I was wrong because it does go into the graphic detail. Um, mm. And so, but I mean, I read it so long ago. I don't want to say my age, but a long time. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? Then you, know, you and I have talked about this before, but that that book was a very important book to me too. Yeah. Uh, and it was one of the first representations that I had seen of something that was similar to my experience. And I felt such a sense of uh, relief and uh, curiosity, like, okay, so, and this book is about so much more than just that one incident. It's really about her, as you talk about, you know, an uplifting book about her entire progress from a really limited life to a very full life. Right. Um, and I, I think I told you that my recollection of the book was that it wasn't specific enough, that I kept going back to it and saying, wait, I want to know exactly what happened. Um, so again, and what, who knows what, how much our memories are affecting us too. When you said that, you, I don't know if you went back and looked at it recently and it's different than you thought it was. Oh no, I had it jammed down my throat. You need to apologize. You are wrong. You are. And I'm just like, while I am wrong about the content in it, and I do believe that it should come with a warning and parents should have the right to say whether or not they want their children to read it. And kids should have a right to decide. There should be another option. Mm -hmm. I still don't think it should be pulled. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I think we're in agreement there too, that, that, and there's some books that are so sturdy and big and important. Yeah. They do tread into scary places, but Thank if you're you. in the hands of a writer like Maya Angelou, you're safe. I mean, she's put a lot of thought into that moment. She doesn't want to traumatize right. the reader. Right. And I mean, that's a whole nother, a whole nother conversation because 
I feel like you were also safe in the race category with her, where a lot of authors today, I do not feel like are safe. I feel like they're taking, there is an agenda. And I don't know that she had an agenda as much as this was my experience, which is very, very different. I, Mm -hmm. books have the power to, all I can say, everything that I've become in my life is because I read. You know, when, when other people were being promiscuous, I was reading books <laughs> and, um, and it, it determines like who I wanted to marry, the life I wanted to have, the kind of parent I wanted to be, the person that I was, like, I realized that you could overcome really bad things through books like The Little Princess and The Secret Garden. So I realized you could change your personality and be a kinder human being. Or you could let bitterness make you ugly and isolated. Mm -hmm. So there's all these beautiful things that you can accomplish with books. There's knowledge and compassion, which I think is what your book likely has in mind, right? Mm -hmm. Um, But people can use, people can spin things around to whatever they, they want it to be. Yeah, I think I... My, my experience was similar to yours in the way that books saved my life. And I think for a lot of kids, books are a safe, private place to explore what they need to explore. Right. And so I think one of the places where um, we might disagree is that, and maybe we don't, I'm not 100% sure about this, but let's say you're the only, you're a queer kid in a very... Uh, hetero world and you're wondering if there's something wrong with you and being able to read about that experience privately safely um, feels like it's offering a um, a helping hand to a lonely kid I don't know if we disagree on that but that notion that there's this agenda of queering kids is is uh concerns me uh so to say more about sure. that. Okay. So I think it comes down to the content. I do not have a problem with a queer child being in a book. I have a problem with a book telling kids how they can transition without their parents' permission or mm-hmm. without their parents knowing. I have a problem with, um, are you familiar with the four olds, Mao's four olds? So it's a cultural revolution. Um, and one of the things that you do is uh, you destroy old traditions, old customs, old religions, and old ideas. And these books are, are saying that your parents are old fashioned. You should find another adult to trust. Um, and also the whole like basic some of these books one book I'm thinking of in particular called the player's handbook um just within the first few pages of the book it talks about how to go to Planned Parenthood how to get your um suppressant drugs online gives you the numbers I don't think uh this book is gay should have the information in it to um, to learn learn how to use, is it Tinder? I think it's Tinder. I think that's too much information for kids. There's mm-hmm. a difference between saying you're not alone, you're, mm-hmm. you're, you're fine, questioning, or not questioning, knowing who you are is fine, and mm-hmm. people should treat you with respect. Mm-hmm. But we have books that are flat out teaching activism to children. And I'm talking kids, like kids who cannot vote, Or kids who wouldn't necessarily vote, say girls who, say lesbian girls who worked their butts off to be prime athletes. And then they're being told through a book or through whatever else, also through apps, Mm -hmm. go out and protest. And they don't want to, but they're being told that you must do this. That's different. One of the things, representation, okay representation people who feel that they need to be represented in every single book to learn from I don't understand that I think books can be mirrors but that turns us it can it can feed into that narcissistic 
viewpoint mm -hmm. or books can be windows which i think your book probably is mm -hmm. you you look out and you see the world around you and you have a greater grasp of the world um so a book yeah like this book is gay um i think that i think that it shouldn't be in a junior high i don't know mm -hmm. if it should be in a high school but i definitely don't think that books they're they're trying to in my opinion break the innocence of children so mm -hmm. they're showing them this is what a blowjob looks like yeah not appropriate yeah and i think you're you know that notion too it's feeling like the parents are being undermined uh that they are losing the opportunity to have those kinds of conversations privately with their own kids i think there's a way too that we might be talking about two different kinds of families, that there's a family where that does hold the child and nurture and love and support and answer questions. And then there's a different kind of family where, um, you know, there's an unwanted pregnancy and maybe, and this is yes. a, a truthful example, unfortunately all too common, that it's a family member you know, an older male family member who's responsible for that pregnancy. And so for that child to have access to Planned Parenthood information is very, very different than the child who is in, a, in an intact, loving family. Yes. Um, so different readers. Yeah, definitely different readers. And that's why I think I support the rating system. I don't think that it's fair for children who, students who, um, don't want certain things maybe they have for my son I have tried my best to not push my faith on him and I have conversations with him regularly that the faith that you have now may not be what you have when you get older I hope that it is but if it's not your faith your faith journey is your journey okay when it comes to books there are people who who have their faith and they don't want to put certain things into their minds. So without that rating system, you pick up a book and you think that you're getting, you know, 12th night, mm -hmm. but that's not what you're getting. Mm -hmm. And it does seem like it's intentional. I think I told you about going to um, my favorite bookstore in Portland, Powell's Books. And I specifically, I had a, a young child who read way above his age so he's in second grade and he's reading at like an eighth grade level he's already read everything percy jackson he's just he's done right <laughs> and, and um i go to i go into powell's and i said we are people of faith we are looking for a book that you know that would be appropriate that is that is a safe book but that also maybe has something about architecture or something. These are the things that he's interested in. And she walks right over to a book. She hands it to me and she's like, oh, he's going to love this book. And within the second page, the book was about um, LGBTQIA. And he's an eight-year-old. And my view on, on teaching my child about this stuff is that you treat everybody decently. You know, I personally will not live by lies. And I do believe that um, I do believe that there is a, a crisis when 46% of Utah identify as part of the queer community. I think that there's, I don't want to say something in the water, but there's, 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 there's a trend versus natural scientific biology in my opinion. So yeah, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, I feel like that's a really bad experience in the bookstore, especially when you were very forthright and clear about who you were and what you wanted for your child, that that is your privilege and responsibility to share that information with your child. That is not for a stranger to decide. So I'm, I, that's very unfortunate. Well, and that's what we're getting is a lot of books like Scholastic has completely changed. And I've put books on the shelves because I've been a volunteer librarian in my son's school. And I've put books on the on the shelves that I'm seeing come through my list of books that are questionable. And sometimes I'll push back and I'm like, really? Really, like this is, that's ridiculous. 
And sometimes I'm like, oh my gosh, I had no idea because that front cover didn't show mm -hmm. what it was. And I had no idea that I was putting that out there for people that they're, that the age wasn't appropriate for. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think we're having this conversation because books are so powerful. If they didn't have a kind of that big impact, um, we wouldn't be talking about this at all. And I think it's also worth noting that what's on the internet and on TV and in the movies yeah. is far worse and put together with far much, far less thought and sensitivity. But books are powerful. Well, I'm not sure. Okay. So people will say that you cannot have porn unless it's pictures. But, and I know this from experience, which, you know, some people are not going to feel comfortable with, but um, there are sites like sexstories.com that are way more than a literati than, than literatica. They are, um, they are so graphic. They are so violent that sometimes I will read one and I am just like, oh my gosh, what, what did they just say? So sometimes words can be more powerful than, mm -hmm. than what's on TV. But then there's that other thing of in a library, in a school library, I, I think a parent has a right to, to believe that their children, when they're going to a public school paid for by our tax dollars, that their kids are in a safe position. And so I think that, that a school library should be held to a higher standard of what comes into those, the, what goes onto those shelves. Mm -hmm. And you're not talking about sanitizing, are you? I mean, for instance, a Holocaust book, those oh. are really difficult stories to read, oh. but it prepares your child and my child for the world that is. Right. It doesn't sound like that's what you're talking about. I mean, no. it sounds like, I, I, I also want to make sure I understand, I think that you're interest in your mandate is much more about sexually explicit material yes. than things that have to do with race or um, critical race theory or right conversations that we'd be having about history what may or may not have happened well I'm not a fan of critical race theory mm -hmm. so very much not a fan of of critical race theory um I'm actually the advisor to two groups on the subject um I'm very, very concerned about what teaches our children to other others. Mm -hmm. So, um, so in terms of sanitization there, I mean, I really love Jason Reynolds books, um, like his track series, really, really enjoyed them. Mm -hmm. I would not read Stamp from the beginning. I've mm -hmm. listened to Ibram X. Kendi, not a fan. I believe he's a grifter. Um, and I think that it, there's a lot of division. Um, there's there's a lot of division. And I, the biggest issue for me is not to, if you teach critical race theory. It's that if you teach it as fact. I have no problem with hearing the worst things. My little <laughs> my little homeschool group of boys, my, my preteen group, said, we want to know what made Hitler who he was. And I'm like, I really don't want to dig into that, but I will, because it's important to me that the kids get the answers that they, that they, that they want. And they, none of them, let me be very clear, none of them, none of them appreciate or, or <laughs> idolize that gotcha. him at all. Right. Um, and I don't have a problem if you want to talk about who Patrice Cullors really was, is, um, if you want to talk about Karl Marx, I just did that with my, with my class for six weeks. Um, but I, and, and what we did in my class is we would watch pro and anti videos. We'd watch professors and then we would stop and pause and ask the questions and go deeper. Mm -hmm. I have no problem with that. So if that's what sanitizing means, no, I'm not for that. Mm -hmm. I am absolutely uh, appalled that Canada has a school district that is re removing any book about before 2018 mm -hmm. because they're not equitable. I am just like that that makes no sense to me because there's so many books that are older than 2018 
that are worth listening to and, and pushing an ideology on our kids. Mm -hmm. You know, um, again, critical race is not my area of experience or expertise. So I don't want to uh, yeah. speak to that in a way that would be uninformed, but I think you're raising some really good points. And I actually made a couple notes, so I don't forget to, to yes, mention. Yes, no, that's them. fine. I've got a notebook. But, um, there are things that we're going to read about that are going to upset us, whether it has to do with the Holocaust or slavery, or let's take child trafficking. They should upset us. You know, those are those are ills in the world that, as we were talking about before, uh, create context, understanding, empathy, God willing, it creates leaders, the future leaders of the world who are going to be aware and not commit those same mistakes but what you what really struck me was when you talked about presenting both sides to these uh, kids and allowing them to make form their own opinions that there's something very respectful toward the child toward the child's mind toward his or her ability to be discerning and to become the kind of reader and thinker that um, we want them to be and so that means to me that there is a place for these hard books yes. um, and that what we want to do in the end is help kids uh, develop their own uh, opinions and their own um, sense of themselves like oh I don't know I don't read that kind of I don't, I'm not interested in um, erotica or no I find books about uh, this with this much violence that that's not right for me um, so that they are people in the world who um, know what's good for them, as opposed to having somebody else set that agenda, whether it's from the left or from the right. Right. Well, and also, I think a huge part of that is what's age appropriate. And and the right. argument is, is that because they have cell phones, everything's age appropriate. That's BS. Yeah, <laughs> I'm sorry, agree. but it's just... It's just not young children, and I'm talking maybe sixth grade and below. They are sponges. Everything that they take, they're going to take for face value. Mm -hmm. And so teaching them any kind of ideology, I believe, is wrong. So mm -hmm. I would not be okay with teaching kids, unless they're going to a religious school, I'm not okay with teaching them religion as truth mm -hmm. I'm perfectly fine with teaching the very basics of buddhism islam christianity judaism fine if you're teaching them the basics as in this is who their important person is this is their important holiday this is whatever but teaching them this as truth is using them. i and agree then, yeah you know I don't disagree. I had a conversation the other day with a bunch of uh, graduate students, people who are in training to be teachers. And we were talking about one of my books, um, which is about uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who was a, a minister who signed up yes. uh, to be part of the plot to kill Hitler. And that was such an interesting dilemma. This was a person who believed his government was acting immorally in his name, and he overrode his own basic um, beliefs. Uh, to sign up to do something that he would otherwise never have done. But one of the things we talked about was this may be the only book this kid reads about Hitler or about the Holocaust or about Bonhoeffer. So I have a responsibility knowing that, as you said, they're sponges at that point, not to put my thumb on the weight, you know, not to put my thumb on the scale. Yes. I have views. Sure, I do. Right. But in a book that's going to go into a school library or a public library, it's not my place to uh, indoctrinate. And and I and you and as a writer, you become very very aware of that. That this book is going to land in Utah. This book is going to land in Florida. This book is going to land in another home in you know Maine. And um, you have a big responsibility. And, and, and I'm also sensitive to this notion of, um, you know, the cultural elites. Yes, I live on the East Coast. I'm, uh, that's, I'm, I'm politically uh, progressive. That doesn't mean that because I have a pen in hand and, the opportun and a platform that I have um, the opportunity to 
um, indoctrinate or to speak down. I think I'm very aware, having traveled in the middle of the country, how often people feel spoken down to, condescended to from people on the coasts. And I think that leads to a lot of distance and a lot of resentment. Well, we have that we have that here now. So, and I think what it happened is we have a, we have a lot of people who have transplanted into Utah. I'm one of them. So I'm coming from Washington state. Um, and definitely a lot of rural people don't know their own minds. Well, I don't think there's anything wrong with living on a farm and running it for, for generations. That doesn't make you stupid. That makes you hardworking. It means that your experience is different. And Indeed. Some of the things that I have seen most recently in the last couple of weeks in colleges, I used to feel very bad about the fact that I didn't go to college. So, I mean, I went for a year, but I, you know, I felt very bad and very like inferior, but I sit in rooms with senators on a regular basis and, and you know, it doesn't change my worth, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. but to many people it does. It's so, it, I will say that it's, it's, a, it's, it's not surprising to me you're an author that you're that you're progressive but in my experience so many progressives have really diminished my my thought and and who I am and and, and I sit there going you say that your goals and your guilt and whatever else comes down to people like me you know racial minorities grew up in foster care you know your your goal is to help us but when I don't say exactly what you want in the box that you want it in, I'm erased. Mm-hmm. And that's in our, that's what's happening in the libraries. So a lot of these books, especially, I, they're just, they're making them so fast. It's, I mean, mm-hmm. <laughs> and I think it's cheap. And I think it is, uh, I love that you have integrity. I really appreciate that you have integrity because a lot of these things just seem like very cheap. Like maybe I know people who write with AI, you know, (laughs) I just am like, um, it just seems like how much, how much can we blow the minds of these Mm -hmm. students? Mm -hmm. You know, I'm really lucky. I have a wonderful editor and she's absolutely devoted to making top quality books. And it takes a long time. And she has a huge team, not huge, but she has a lot of people who look through everything that we uh, submit to say, you know, is this as good as it could possibly be? Is this sensitive to that point of view? Is this historically accurate? And so I'd rather have my kids, you know, have their hands on a book, obviously, that went through that process than something that's slick and cheaply made or something that's on the internet. In general, I think publishing is very careful. At least that's my experience. How long have you been writing? Oh my gosh, since I was a kid, but my first book came out about 25 years ago. Wow. Yeah. And, and what books have you written? They're all, my uh, just for a moment of humor. Okay. So my son says, mom, what do you do to come up with the ideas for these books? What do you do? Google the word sad. I've written about self-injury. I've written about drug abuse, child trafficking, genocide. Um, I've also written uh, with Malala, the girl who uh, was shot by the Taliban for speaking out on behalf of education. And I've also done some, some picture books and the Hitler book that I told you about. I'm driven to write about things that are a little darker and that they're in the shadows. They're in the darkness because we don't want to talk about them. We're afraid to talk about them. And I guess it has to do with my own background, but I want to bring those things to light in a compassionate way, in a careful way, like for just a quick minute, girls who self-injured, they are in terrible pain doing this in silence, in secrecy, Uh, that kind of secrecy, that kind of darkness doesn't serve them, doesn't allow them to get the empathy or the understanding or the help that they need. So yeah, if my daughter came home carrying that book, I would sit up and say, hey, honey, what's going on? You know, that is a book that has helped a lot of people um, get get help, get attention, but it's not an easy book. 
Um, yeah, I don't think that I would have an issue with, I mean, I can see how some kids who don't, have never considered it, may then consider it. You know, that's an argument that's been made. And there was one uh, school principal who took all the copies of cut and put them in the school safe and said, I'll give them back to you. The girls are cutting themselves and it's because of this book and I'll give them back to you when there's no more cutting. And the librarian said, no, girls are cutting themselves and now there's a book that allows them to talk about it. I don't think copycatting uh, in most cases occurs. I don't think there's such a thing. I think if you're going to actually do something so severe as to hurt yourself that way, there's a lot already going on. And um, same thing with um, these depictions of difficult um, sexual experiences like sexual assault. People have talked about that's going to make girls not want to be female. You know, I don't believe that you transition because you've read about a sexual assault in a book. I think the leap is too, too great, but I guess that's what I was Right. trying to say before about I was talking about how books are so powerful people are fearful that this is going to happen to their kids These, this is not you you know you and I are one set of readers we're adults we get to choose um these are vulnerable readers yeah yeah th there's a question on do we put those do we put the ideas out there in the first place and some people will say no I just want my kid completely sheltered but then they get into the real world and they get massive culture shock because they're like I didn't even know that this was a thing. You know, I picked up Karl Marx's essays um, because I don't want somebody to tell my son, your, your parents are so backwards. They would never let you know how wonderful. I want him to be able to say, actually, this is what I think. This is what I know. And oh, and by the way, this is a quotation from him so that it really shuts down that conversation immediately. That's, that's what I, I want. Think you're equipping your child, but you're making the choice. You're equipping yes. your child for the real world. Yes. And also it's not something that I just let him take into his room and read on his own. You know, mm -hmm. These are the kind of conversations that we have together. So, mm -hmm. um, and I think that there's, you know, I really do think that I come down on most books with rate them, just rate them so that kids know what they're what they're getting into there's some things that are so the graphic novels okay i'm sorry but you can't warn a child when they open up a book and they see people performing oral sex mm -hmm. they've seen it now mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know and if they're in middle school so sixth seventh eighth grade and 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 that it, they've just now seen that you can't take it out the image is there mm -hmm. so yeah. so in those cases I think that honestly I would use the term evil when people want to expose kids to that because when I was a foster parent if you would have had certain books in your home you you couldn't get licensed mm. but now we're putting them in schools and saying this is perfectly normal this is representation mm -hmm. and I know gay people I know I know lesbian students mm -hmm. who are like I don't want to see this mm -hmm. and I also don't want to be reduced to this mm -hmm. like why why the fact that I'm attracted to a woman should that determine the content of what I want to read. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't agree that the people, you know, the, and I think we're talking in very broad terms that people are putting those books into the world are evil. I think, and I shouldn't even pretend to walk in somebody else's shoes since I don't know. My guess is they wouldn't want those books in a junior high either. And that that's the kind of book that's supposed to puncture the isolation that that author might have had when he or she was a, a young person coming out. And I'm guessing that that's the intent. But... It might be. Um, 
I, I asked you this before, but what do you think of the myth of innocence? So we talked about this and I thought, oh my gosh, I'm not 100% sure I know what that means as a term. Because I think there's ways in which people speak and we're in different silos. People use different language. So, you know, to talk about shorthand almost. Right. To, right. So, so um, let's be, so, so do you mind if we redo what we did last time? Yeah. Uh, help um, define the term and then I can tell you more about my feelings. Sure. Okay. So the myth of innocence is that um, children are little adults and that it's oppressive to keep things from them. So they should just, they should just absorb, um, keeping them one, one example. And this comes from Gail Rubin's queer theory is that children who are sexually abused, it wouldn't be that big of a deal if their parents didn't make it that big of a deal. Hmm. Okay. So I, then in that case, I don't believe in the myth of innocence. I don't think children are little adults. I think we have lots of great science that would indicate that developmentally, physically, emotionally, they are not little adults at all. And that we have to really slot into where they are developmentally if we're going to care for them well in the terms of the things that we give them. Um, and that issue of the, I think the last example that you used was this notion that um, it's the reaction to childhood sexual abuse that somehow it, it, it wouldn't be such a big deal. It's a big deal. And it can be made worse by the reaction of the parents, for sure. I think when you finally come out with telling somebody that this has happened to you, it's very important that you get a good and sympathetic hearing. Otherwise, you're going to feel so much more shame and so much more secrecy all over again. So I very much disagree with that. I, I feel like there's something in the middle, though, that I didn't cover. We talked about little adults and we talked about the issue of sexual assault, but I think there was something in the middle. So it's so a lot of professionals, especially mental health and educators, are being taught that it is their job. So I was listening to, it was funny. I was in a restaurant with a friend who was another teacher mm -hmm. and the people on the other, at the next table were talking about the myth of innocence. And they said, well, innocence, well, if you believe in that. And then the other person said, your job is to plant a garden where the parents have left their children barren. Hmm. So a garden within their minds. Yeah. So. Well, again, I think it sort of goes back to, and I have heard from other parents saying, um, I don't want mental health professionals talking to my kids about this. I don't want, you know, when a child stands up in a classroom and says, you know, something's happening at home uh, and, and give that information to the teacher. Um, I've heard parents say, this teacher is not a mental health expert. I don't want her handling this information. Um, you know, sometimes that's the first place where the information can come out. Um, and I agree that, you know, not all teachers are as well equipped to handle that information as others. Um, but as far as mental health professionals, again, I think it's one of those things where we're talking about two different kinds of families. In your family, you are committed, devoted to uh, raising your, your child. There are other families where that's just not the case and that the mental health professional is the one adult that they're going to encounter that does have their children's interests at heart if they're in an abusive situation. I mean, I don't know what your experiences were like in foster care with the mental health professionals that you encountered. And it sounds like it was a very mixed, very mixed bag. So it's, it's really interesting. I do a regular podcast. Um, I'm, I'm a regular guest on a podcast with mental health professionals. And I would say that my therapist, Paul Martin, um, had so much impact on who I became. You know, it was never, I was never taught, um, first off, I'm, I'm unique in that I never took what happened to me as my fault. Mm -hmm. um, but I also never became 
a mental victim. Mm -hmm. It was like, this happened. The adults in my life were not good people. Um, and I have a choice. And so I had this therapist who for almost all of my time in foster care was my therapist. Um, the same, the same one. And he helped me like find role models. And the thing about therapy before, and this is why it's different. So the thing about therapy before is that therapy was about helping you find an end game, helping you progress to a place of healing. Therapy today, and there's a lot of therapists talking about this because they are being trained now that one thing they are not supposed to um, provide services for the quote unquote Trump supporter. So they're being taught to put activism above therapy. So if I come in looking like I do, I obviously, they have to address, it doesn't matter, say, knock on wood, I'm, I am superstitious, but if my family was in a car wreck and I needed a therapist to deal with my grieving, they would want to discuss why that was due to systemic racism and how I feel about my blackness first. So I would never go to a therapist today, which is mm -hmm. really sad because I'm a huge advocate for taking care of your mental health and healing. Mm -hmm. But when it becomes an agenda, which it has become, mm -hmm. so they're, they're literally teaching these people, you cannot serve, you do not, basically that we are not human mm -hmm. if we do not all agree. I don't have direct experience with that, so I can't speak to that. That um, would make you feel very alienated and very shut out, especially when you need help. Yes. Um, I just wanted to go back a second. I think I was speaking a bit in extremes, like yeah. that, you know, there's your family, which are you're devoted to raising your kid, and there are these other families where a mental health uh, adult is going to be the only adult that that child encounters who's really got their interest at heart. And then I think there's that whole middle section. And when we send our kids to therapy, which I've, I've done, um, <laughs> uncomfortable information has come back to me. You know, I had a therapist told me you know, my, my son was smoking pot. Okay. I really didn't like hearing that, but I did not know that and I didn't have access to that information yeah. and by by having that intermediary that trained intermediary um, bring me that information we were able to address it yeah. uh, but that is very different than what you're talking about this feeling of uh, that the deck is already stacked against you before you even go into the office that you're not going to be greeted with um, neutrality and um, that is the same to bring it back to books that mm -hmm. is the same thing that's happening as they get rid of all of these books and they say, we only want books that are equitable in the libraries, or we have no problem with, with shaming Christians. And this is, this is literally happening. So there's, um, there's a mandala of intersectionality and it's probably 150 ways of which you can be privileged or not privileged. Mm -hmm. But they're teaching this as truth and it's coming in. So these books are coming in, like I said, as truth. Mm -hmm. And that is where, that's where the issue for me comes from. Like, yeah. I think when anybody thinks they have a monopoly on the truth, we have a problem. Yeah. I would agree with that. So, and I, yeah. And I think that uh, where things get dicey is when one parent says, uh, I don't want anybody to read this book as opposed to, I don't want my own child to read it. I think with all these things end up talking, we end up talking in extremes. Yes. Yes. And some of the agenda stuff, I can see what you're saying and that there are people who are writing because they, they have felt a certain way. Um, what is it? Queer. I can't remember something. The, the the main book about being queer. I can't remember what it's called, but gender queer. Gender queer. That's it. Gender queer. Okay. Um I believe that person is writing from the from an experience of um of wanting to help people who've been in their in their situation. But the ones that flat out are like 
it was my sixth grade year. My parents are old fashioned. They have old values. They make us go to this boring church. You know, all of this just right at the beginning of the book Mm -hmm. feels very targeted. Mm -hmm. And I think, honestly, well, like I said before, I I believe that we're in a cultural revolution. Mm -hmm. I believe that our children are being groomed to be a new red card. Mm. And um, that's really, really hard to watch. And it's something, it's not something that I came to just because, I don't know, like watching some person on YouTube, like some pastor or something. It's nothing like that. It's because I interview people who've escaped communism. Mm -hmm. That's mainly what I do. And when they say, this is how it happened, these were the steps that happened. Mm-hmm. and um, and we're watching that exact thing happen mm-hmm. and books is just one way that it's coming in but when they get rid of so many quality books I think they've thrown reason out out the door mm-hmm. you know I think if we could zoom out a little bit one of the things that you're talking about is parents feeling undermined Yes, and feeling feeling it's sort of back where we were at the very beginning, um, wanting to protect kids. We have the same desire, and going about it in very different ways. And if we can come back to this place where we do have something in common, you don't want to be undermined as a parent. I don't want to be undermined as a parent. We want to protect our kids. We want to enlighten our kids. Um, that. Uh, then we can, then we can get somewhere, then we can have a conversation like the one that we're having. But if people stay in their separate corners and just feel like, oh, there are these people out there who are trying to groom my kids. Um, that's a, a, a very fearful place to be in. And, um, it feels kind of powerless, I would think. Um, but I bet you there's parents on the other side of the agenda who feel the same way. Well, they'll, you know, book banning, right? That's the, mm-hmm. that's the common tor- term. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's, that's an interesting, I'm always amused by that because it wasn't that long ago, maybe five years ago that um, uh, Dr. Seuss books were removed. Mm-hmm. So to me, that is more of a book ban, removing the books, mm-hmm. not selling the books anymore. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, the author who wrote who wrote the book about transitioning um, a bunch of progressives went to Amazon and said we don't want her book Abby um, but we don't want her book it's harmful um, remove it and Amazon removed it for a short time and they put it back on mm-hmm. I can't remember what the book's called I'll have to I don't know either, but I think, you know, everybody's in this defensive crouch. Like they're so afraid to do anything because they're going to be attacked. Right. But here's the thing. And I I totally agree. And I don't, I feel so bad that, that, um, that I know people who have said really hurtful things, especially to you because you're a lovely human being. And so it's really like to not even be able to sit and have a conversation with another person is really a scary place to be in because we are othering each other. Right. You know, and it's all I see, fear, fearful or not, all I see is not seasoned juice. Mm-hmm. I see hating someone because you're told to. Mm-hmm. And I cannot, my head does not wrap around that and I will fight for it. Like I told you, my name is Carib. <laughs> Mm -hmm. (laughs) I I will fight because I believe that is truly evil Mm -hmm. I think you're so right and that fear can flip to anger so fast anger can flip to hate so fast and hate Um, I have a question for you go ahead you told your friends that we're doing this podcast because I've told some of mine and they're like why you know why would you do that so my friends are most of my friends that are, that I have left are um, are are similar to me, just in terms of 
being kind of the open-minded activist parent advocate type of person. My acquaintances is, is another story. Okay. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, but I used to be, most of my friends have always been progressive. My background's in theater. I, I lived in Seattle. My friends went to Evergreen. Okay. Um, but that is so, that's so interesting to me because I'm, I'm listening to you and in the back of my head, I'm like, she's a progressive, but how, because what I've seen and what I've experienced from the progressive left has been painful. Mm -hmm. It has been painful and reductive and mm -hmm. just gut-wrenchingly sad. Mm -hmm. So, um, but I've also, I mean, there's a progressive right too. So there's mm -hmm. a lot of people yeah. who like live in the white guilt world and, but it only goes so far. <laughs> mm -hmm. And if your person is like, I don't buy into that. They're like, wait, I can't save you. And, you know, it becomes a mess. But um, I'm sorry. Oh, so book banning. Oh yeah. Um, in Canada, they they burned books a couple of years ago. They pulled out the books from old white men and they burned them. Hmm. My side of the argument is not asking to burn books. Mm -hmm. Asking to remove from public schools the most atrocious of the books, and. I would never, and I do have people, I do have acquaintances who are like, next, it's the public libraries. And I, I would not put my name on that. Hmm. I would not put my name on that. I prefer that a children's section doesn't have sex in it, mm -hmm. but I'm not going to go fight that because it's a public library. Mm -hmm. You don't have a right to expect, um, the same in my opinion the same safeties that you do in a public school mm -hmm. there are people who lock up and and not because they're bad people because because maybe their children are adopted and their children sexually assault other children and so they lock up their devices and they make sure that there's nothing in their home mm -hmm. that can bring their kids in that direction mm -hmm. i understand that as a kid, I would have looked for the most raunchy, you know, the, the Fabio style books and, <laughs> you know, and I would have like read them and I would have talked to my friends about them. So in a way I could have been considered a groomer back then. Mm -hmm. Thankfully, the details of what they have, what's in the books today were not in the books back then at least not the books that I could get my hands on. Mm -hmm. But um, so I think that it's, it's very complicated and it's okay that it's very complicated. Mm -hmm. um, I just appreciate that, that you don't believe your books should be in junior highs. So. <laughs> and now the next thing is like, how in the world do we get, because we have teachers pushing and saying we want them these kids need to have them and it's almost like they're sadists honestly like that's how I feel like why 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 do you want this in front of young kids mm -hmm. it, it it feels uh, and for here it's it's a cultural thing of people either move here or people have left the Mormon faith and mm -hmm. they resent it so much that they want to destroy mm. and I do see that I, uh, there's, mm -hmm. there's forums that you can see where people are just like, I was made to be so innocent. I was made to wear these kind of clothes. I was made, you know, whatever else our children deserve something different. Mm -hmm. You know, that's not something I've been exposed to where I live. Um, I was also thinking about the teachers and librarians that I've talked to who, uh, and I think they're reasonable and, and and I don't think that they want my book in a junior high. I haven't had that experience, but that what is happening to them when they speak out on behalf of the kids' rights to read, that then they're attacked. Their, you know, their, their salaries and their home addresses are published. They're called groomers. Oh. You know, it's just what you were talking about at the very, very beginning. Like you don't attack the individual. Right. And it gets so, if we get so quickly down in the gutter like that, you know. Yeah. 
we're not going to get anywhere. But I see it happening on, on both sides of, of the equation. There's so much meanness. Yes. But I guess it's because what we're talking about is so precious. It's our kids. Yes. You know, and I think that all parents have a, 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 a reluctance to see their kids grow up too fast. I would say that that's universal, even though it's at different tempos and different families. Um, and um, again, it's the. Do you really think so? If if they're okay with their kids, you know, seeing fellatio in a book or reading about it, that they that all parents have that issue. I feel like there's a lot of parents who want to be the cool parent. Oh, maybe you're right about that. I hadn't thought of it quite that way. I don't know. I mean, I I, I could be wrong, I but I just, I don't know. <laughs> I, I look at parenting and it's such a precious gift to me. I only have one child, mm -hmm. you know, and I, it, to me, it's a very precious gift and I don't want him to be sheltered and naive, mm -hmm, right? but I do want him to be I want him to be worldly in the right way. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't want his mind to be broken. Mm -hmm. And I know that um, Antonio Gramsci, no, okay. He was kind of a revolutionary, I believe in Italy. And he wanted sex in front of the kids as early as possible. Um, or the book 1984, right? Where they're mm -hmm. experimenting with, that's what that's the kind of stuff that we're seeing and and I so when when teachers are okay with that mm -hmm. um even then I don't know people will constantly like I will have people who will who will reach out and say this happened in my school what can you help me do about it and I will share the story without sharing the teacher's name because I don't want the person to be doxxed because like I said before I think that they've been slow boiled into mm -hmm. believing what they're doing is right. Mm -hmm. um, but we've, we're all impacted by what we've learned, right? And so the idea of going to a person's home and attacking them, or even just, I mean, the internet can be a cruel place. And there are people who, there are people who kill themselves over struggle mm -hmm. sessions right and 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 cancellation and things like that I don't want to be a part of that mm -hmm. like that's the reason why I think it's important to have these conversations is because I think there's more of us who don't want a part of the ugly mm -hmm. I get that is so but I absolutely know that like a person who comes into a, a preschool class and wants to talk to the kids about their sexuality, um, their gender identity or whatever else is taking away their innocence. I don't think a kid needs to know in order to love you. Mm -hmm. How do you feel about a book like Entango Makes Three, where there's a, you know, do you know that story about the oh. two male, it's a true story about two male penguins in the Central Park Zoo, who, um, you know, there was an orphan penguin and they they raised it. And so that was their family. And it's okay. a story about a same sex couple okay. um, having a baby. Uh, since you don't know the book, it's probably a little harder to answer, but um, that notion makes the one kid in that class or the two or the six that have same-sex parents feel like, oh, okay, I'm okay. You know, I'm safe yeah. here as opposed to what you're talking about. So I think, I think we're way past that. I think that there's a huge difference between, you know, Sally has two mommies or, mm -hmm. you know, a book like that and a book that shows kids like it's perfectly normal and shows you know kids how to have sex that's a big difference I don't care if it's gay or straight yeah um, I mean yeah sex ed it just depends if we're talking about preschool you know middle school high school I don't know if you ever had I went to Catholic school so our version of sex ed was pretty limited <laughs> and I could I could have used a little more help on the specifics to protect yeah. me actually right. and make me have a little bit more agency 
Right. So I can argue for that uh, for an for for older kids who, and I think we need to accept the reality that those kids are having sex yes. or you know, are in in play sexually. Some, some, some. Yeah, I, some. I, um, Absolutely. Yeah. 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 So, and and in in different areas, I don't think as many are having sex um, out here, but the, but I definitely don't think <laughs> I. Sometimes I'm not sure I really live in Utah because the girls wear bras to school, right? <laughs> so and I'm just like, how does that work with your whole religious, the way you go to church on Sunday? Oh, okay, whatever. That's that's your family's thing, right? Yeah. So I'm sure that there are, are people doing that. I I would prefer that, well, my my preference for, for kids is classical literature for for kiddos for younger kids Mm -hmm. um I don't have an issue I don't think um we had a teacher who the first week of school for eighth graders on purpose showed them a a cartoon that she shouldn't have showed them that ended with two men kissing and when the boys responded with ew gross she got mad at them and she scolded them and said, we don't talk about how we feel at this school. Hmm. Yeah, that teacher isn't getting good training or good support. That crosses over, uh, that that kind of stuff for me crosses over to, why are you abusing kids? Hmm. That's, that's how I feel, you know, because the kids go home and they cry to their parents. And literally boys, 13-year-old boys going home and crying and saying, our teacher is picking on us and there's nothing we can do about it. Mm -hmm. um and what that teacher believes is that they're being empathetic Mm. but I feel like there's a huge difference today um in the beginning I would not have been okay with selling us to moms Mm -hmm. but we're way past that today Mm -hmm. you know we're we're way past that but what but we're not past um you know I think in perfectly normal or in it's perfectly normal there's a brother who's thinking about his sister and her boyfriend having sex and it's pictures and pictures and pictures and pictures. Um, and I don't believe that that should be in a second grade class. You know, when you were talking about classical literature, I was saying, Oh, there's, there's incest. Yes. You no, know, all kinds of, uh, well, the Grimm's fairy tales are fun. <laughs> yeah. So, so there's violence and mm-hmm. yeah, I just, the, the, the guy who was a porcupine that was an interesting story he pokes yeah. one of the i'm like okay yeah. all right that's what happened <laughs> <laughs> i'd never heard the story before i heard it last week and i was like huh well the kiddos are going to think that that means poking mm-hmm. you know the, the details aren't there and i well, think- don't you remember that too when you would get a little older and be like oh that's what that was and i think that's kind of what you're what we're both talking about is having respect for a child to come to his own understanding of these things gradually over time with the accumulation of knowledge and hopefully some good adult uh, guidance along the way. Yes. Yeah. And I, that's the thing is that they're, they're removing the time for a child to be innocent. Mm -hmm. That is, that's the struggle that's that's the struggle and if there wasn't a a viciousness but the thing is is yeah the viciousness is on both sides it really is i think that you we must we must look at the content again i appreciate that you don't want your book your book's not made for junior high kids Mm -hmm. which means it's not made for what age do you believe is appropriate for you know i'm gonna say 14 15 and up okay in part because um, the victims are 13, 14 and okay. up. Okay. Yeah, I would not agree. <laughs> yeah, we don't I, have I, to. I, I would shelter. I, I would not want my son to read that. Do you know what else? It's also a question of what 13, 14 year olds I've been exposed to and yeah. what 13, 14 year olds you know. You yeah. know, in my community, that's probably a more. Oh, what's the right word? I don't know. Racy, whatever. Worldly. I've also brought my books, it worldly, uh-huh. into um, 
juvenile uh, corrections facilities all the time. And, and I think, oh my God, this is going to, this is going to be terrible. What are these boys at uh, crossroads in the Bronx going to care about a girl in a mud hut who's being sexually uh, abused? I'm, I'm terrified. I'm going to completely bomb. And these guys are like, oh, you mean men are having sex with girls? Well, then they're not real men. And oh, these these girls are being um, treated as sexual objects, being sexualized ahead of their time. Oh, well, that happened to me too. So I think I the sample section that I have is different. Yeah. Yeah, I I can absolutely see like people get written off and some of the most yeah. empathetic people are people who have gone through heavy things. Right. So um, that, that makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah, it's it's one of those things where you're not going to find the, you don't have to find common ground. You know, when I was asked to reach out to you, the right, goal right. was, of course, you know, can we bring her over to our side? Right. <laughs> Mm -hmm. and and the thing is is that that's that's not the conversation like I wanted to I want to explain our concerns and come off as reasonable Mm -hmm. that's that's my focus but I also want to hear the other side and then I can decide for myself you know I do I know that people are like never use the term evil but there are people I will use the term evil with Mm -hmm. I'm sorry but the the things I saw in the, the things that happened to the innocent people over in Israel. That looks evil to me. That looks really, yeah. really evil to me. I save evil for Vladimir Putin. He's the only person. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I, that, the, I just don't want our kids to be put in extremely vulnerable positions. Mm-hmm. And I feel like you just don't want our kids to be put in extremely vulnerable positions. Mm-hmm. And it really comes down to we're doing the same. We are. We're doing yeah. the same work. And the, the thing that I write about our kids in extremely vulnerable situations, it's already sort of too late for them. Yes. But maybe it's not late for, it's not but, too late for, for policy and for things mm-hmm. to change that can make things mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. better mm-hmm. so I'm just I'm curious and it's been on the back of my head the, the whole mm-hmm. time but what do you feel makes you progressive mm. I think for me it's about you know wanting progress and I was very sensitive to what you were talking about before about the four olds like parents are old institutions are old customs are old we have to break them all down Um, that whole thing about being a disruptor. Um, I just want us to progress a little. Uh, I don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. Not all customs, not all institutions, not all parents are, you know, old and therefore bad or, you know, but there are ways in which we get hidebound and we have a narrow point of view and the people who are in power get to set, set certain agendas and we share the power a little more broadly Um, everybody gets to have a little more piece of the pie and we do progress. There's ways in which we are more fair as a society now than we were 50 years ago. And it's because people challenged those old beliefs and those old institutions. That's why that's to me, that's progressive. And that's probably just my own particular definition. Probably Bernie Sanders would, you know, not agree with that. Well, I just think it's funny because the things you said are the same things I would agree with. (laughs) <laughs> so, and I'm the progressive ideology from what I've read about what I understand is, is very different, um, you know, ideas like let's get rid of grading because it's harmful to black and brown people. To me, that's backwards and also very, very painful mm-hmm. to, to say that black and brown people can't achieve that's the kind of things that I see when I see, because I've, I've, I have a, I have a friend huh. who, um, you know, she would like to see gay marriage in the LDS church. 
Mm-hmm. And so because of that, she would, she will say, I'm progressive because of this. But what I see as progress, I, I still dream and I, this is really dorky, but I dream about like the Star Trek world. You know, when it, there's one episode where he says, you know, for us, uh, we don't care how short you are, or how tall you are, or the color of your skin or anything like none of those things matter. And I think, yes, can we please get there? You know, wouldn't it be interesting if we use something like Star Trek, where everybody can enter, you know, from their own points of view and yes. find what we agree on? Yes. And so it's just, it's interesting because I do have a federal reaction, like I said, because of the things that I've experienced. Um, I mean, I literally sat, it, I was invited into a class and they were teachers and social workers and they wanted to talk about why CRT should be brought into the classroom. And one of the things that they said was, well, how do I grade a paper without considering race? And I thought, my God, how backwards is that? But these people would consider themselves progressive. I want to make sure I understand you yeah. properly, that yeah. they would discount. Yes. Yes, that is that is being taught. That is, that is um, you have to consider race in terms of how a person, maybe how a person writes. Um, okay I think I can see some of that I mean like that's kind of like the notion of the um um what was that Uh, the the universal application for college like you don't know the race of everybody answers the same question and you don't know in theory I suppose you don't know the race of the applicant you're just looking at the words on the page yes as opposed to filtering in yes assumptions but I've also learned you know and of course, there's a lot of these are generalizations. Like um, I teach creative writing. Yes. Um, I have uh, had some students uh, in particular, I had this really such a blast, a woman of color. And I was teaching about, you know, getting to the point quickly. You can't keep, you can't keep the readers waiting for too long. And she comes from a culture of the long yarn. We tell the story slowly and gradually, lots of little trips down side aisles. And and I realized that's her cultural style. That's her way. And my way of saying, oh, no, this is this is the way we get the reader's attention. You got to have them in by page 10. Yes, that's just my way. You know, that's not one better than the other. Well, and perspectives are different than than grading a child's test okay good point okay so like having those perspectives and and the beautiful way like yeah absolutely appreciate the different cultures and the diversity those Mm -hmm. kind of that that makes a lot of sense to me people will say all of the time like why haven't you written your book Mm -hmm. i haven't written my book because my executive functioning skills are (laughs) so so for me the idea of of sitting down and focusing and writing my biography while people will listen to me and they'll think, Oh, that's really interesting. The idea of writing and also the idea of like punctuation and and grammar and getting that right. Yeah. You know, but that does, it's not because of black. Mm -hmm. It's there are, that's, that's extremely insulting to people like Thomas Sowell or Carol Swain or people who you know, teach in universities and happen to be black to say that we, that, that our brains just inherently can't do that. That's not why my brain can't do that. My mm-hmm. brain can't do that because while people were learning in school, those basic things, I was going, how do I survive? How do I not right. get beaten tonight? Your part of your brain was busy somewhere else. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. But, but to, to say that, you know, you can't do this. Or like my son was writing a paper and he wrote C's da day just to be obnoxious. Right. (laughs) And his teacher was like, I understand that you're getting in touch with your cultural roots. And I was just like, what in the world are you? No, it's not acceptable. Like this is, Mm -hmm. you have to write correctly because 
and 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 for people to say you know there's there's a correct and a not correct i find it extremely reductive and i i would give you the badge of saying i don't think you're progressive i think you want progress and there's mm-hmm. something very different in that that doesn't mm-hmm. mean i mean like i'm assuming our our political voting is probably this way and that way but that mm-hmm. still doesn't mean that there's not a common sense there mm-hmm. and you know and and i believe real progress like you said I, and, mm-hmm. and we we should wrap up but 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 yeah. like you said your parent you said your friends your friends were like you're really going to have this conversation well they were more like why are why are you doing that like there's danger abroad here and i just said i'm I'm curious. Yeah. I want to connect. I and want to hear what your perspective is. And right. I feel like you're in the same place I am. Yes. In terms of perspective and curiosity. Yes. You disagree on things, but yeah. This is so much more fun than talking to my friends who agree about everything. And that is real progress. Agreed. Agreed. That is that is the truth. That is, that is the beauty that we still have and the hope that we still have and a progressive ideology or a far right ideology, either one of them say, you cannot have these conversations. You are going into, you know, turbulent waters mm-hmm. and we're not. We just proved them wrong. Yes. Yes. We're, you know, we're two people had a conversation from different perspectives and we learned from each other and I think we have a respect for each other. And I would honestly, like, if I lived by you, I would be like, Oh, I've got a new friend. You know? Same. So yeah. I, I so appreciate this. I, think I do you're... too. I really do. Uh, I'm actually a little sorry that it's over, but <laughs> cause I know we could go deeper and yeah. probably make more progress. I think we were both, um, both honest and gentle with each other, yes. but I bet we keep on going. Yeah, I mean, very much appreciate it. It's been beautiful. And now I'm going to make some people mad because they're going to be like, you didn't come off. (laughs) And, and my friends too. So let's see, let's, let's reconnect when, once you, um, uh, I don't know what you do with a podcast. You post it. Yeah. You put it, you air it. Yes. Let's, let's, let's let's connect again and see. Let's, let's do that. Let's really ask our friends what they thought and where they thought we pulled our punches or where you know we could have been stronger or where they thought we did a good job i would love that let's do it okay. anyways right. it was lovely thank you so it much was, it was really very much uh my honor and my pleasure